So, hi, I'm Keith Altares and I'm here to define what is conceptual art. Conceptual art is sometimes called conceptualism or it is literally called conceptualism. It is an art in which the concepts or ideas involved in the work take precedence over traditional aesthetic and material concerns. Many works of conceptual art, sometimes called installations, may be constructed by anyone simply by following a set of written instructions. So, here is my groupmate, Earl. He's going to explain what conceptual art is and show a video on what conceptual art really means. I am Earl Matthew Perez and I am here to present installations and conceptual art. Decidedly mixed feelings about the genre. Be warned, there are scenes coming up of a middle-aged man in inappropriate clothing. Once upon a time, art was easy to recognise. It was usually in a frame. Paint was involved. It was this, this and this. Stuff your ancestors could identify and usually beautiful to look at. Then, overnight, one man turned everything on its head. Or, at least, at a 90 degree angle. Is it a urinal? Is it a work of art? Well, the whole world of modern art was revolutionised when Marcel Duchamp decided that it was, indeed, a work of art. Duchamp asked the question, how do you make a work of art that isn't a work of art? I think he wanted to take an iconoclast's hammer to the old notion of the artist as a genius, someone whose every touch was invested with a special magic. Duchamp wanted to put an end to all that. And for him to nominate ordinary mass-produced objects, snow shovel, a bottle rack, a urinal, a coat hook, the notion that anything could be a work of art is probably the single biggest art idea of the whole 20th century. A real light bulb moment. Which reminds me, how does a conceptual artist change a light bulb? He calls it a work of art. Of course, that wasn't a joke, that was actually a living sculpture. Who better to ask about his eureka moment than Duchamp himself? The fact that he died in 1968 was no obstacle to a conceptual interview. Can one say that the... The act of selecting an object is enough to turn it into a work of art. One can. It should be completely impersonal. Because if you introduce the choice, or the idea of choice, meaning you introduce, it means that you introduce your taste. And taste is the great enemy of art, A-R-T. Hmm? So did you choose a urinal precisely because of its lack of... Um so-called artistic value. That was the difficulty, to find an object that had no attraction whatsoever from, from the uh, aesthetic angle. There's no denying that without Marcel Duchamp there'd have been no Warhol, no Jeff Koons, no Damien Hirst, no Tracy Emin. In fact, pretty much every Turner Prize winning artist of the last 20 years has been indebted to him in one way or another. Depending on your point of view, Duchamp either opened up a whole new debate about art that's still vibrant and fresh today, or he unleashed a monster. As well as all that, he played tournament chess for over 40 years. Always one move ahead. So was Marcel Duchamp one of the great artistic revolutionaries, or was he simply a very ingenious prankster? Well, people divide. <laughs> So you've got to admit, Marcel Duchamp was the most influential artist of the whole 20th century. I don't deny his influence. I'm just not sure that what he did was art. I think anti-art. If it was anti-art, how come so many contemporary artists, at least 90%, are following in his footsteps? Time to meet a real live conceptual artist. Ryan Gander requested that I wear one of his special white tracksuits when we met at his exhibition in Birmingham. I wasn't sure why, but it seemed churlish not to join in. Ah, oh, there are others like me. Now I begin to understand. The multiplier. The white tracksuit. Hello, teammate. Nice to meet you. What's our function as, as part of the installation? Is there something I should Your be doing? Your functions are different. Ah. Because you're interviewing me. 
He's an invigilator for the gallery. But am I, am I part of the piece? No, the clothes are part of the piece. You're a TV presenter. Matthew Harrison is a young artist from Sheffield, following very closely in the bike wheel tracks of Marcel Duchamp. It would be difficult to make a bike wheel in contemporary art now with all the associations to Duchamp, unless you, you kind of activate it in some way by cycling to Paris, letting me tire down in front of the Alpha Tower, blowing it up and, and biking back. The track seat's a vessel for an idea. It oh, carries yeah. the idea in a way. Right. But you are not carrying the idea. You're wearing the vessel that carries the idea. Thank, thank goodness. It's quite simple. <laughs> and how do I know that you're not secretly just pretending to, well, to, to go <laughs> to Paris yeah. and just taking this bike wheel, putting a tyre on it and saying, here you go, mate. That's fresh Paris air for you. Well, you, you could trust me. Point is, the idea is everything. Hmm. I've noticed that I've got embroidered blood on my tracksuit. Why are they art? To explain to me um, why they're art. Embroidered on the back, it says uh, 96 cc's of Chinese air. Why do you think we've got blood? Uh, I think it uh, alludes to something that's happened, maybe has happened, an incident that's possibly occurred, but we don't quite know what, what this incident is or how, how this blood has come, come to be here. It's definitely conceptual. Um, some people might just think it was a pair of shoes. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I f personally find it quite hard to see the connection yeah. between those objects or, or to piece together the logic that might connect the objects. But your logic would be different to mine anyway. If, if you use that as a toolkit to make a work of art, then the work of art that you would make and I would make and the next person would make would be totally different. I'm getting a bit conceptually lost, in a sense. I'm not stuck, I'm just thinking, get a grip. It's only conceptual art. What, what is it that it is? Is it the air that is? Or is it the shoe that is, that's around the air? What is the thing that is? Um. Well, my, my idea is different to your idea. Well, my idea of your idea might be different from someone else's idea of your idea. It's all windmills within wheels, within wheels, within <laughs> windmills. You know where conceptual art's really big, don't you? No, surprise me. Our favourite country, Belgium. Of course conceptualism thrives in Belgium. They think it's a good idea to eat mayonnaise <coughs> with chips there too. We're all working under those things that Duchamp set up. Art's a mountain without a summit in a way because you, you aim to get higher but you, know, and you, know, you aim to uh, make, contribute to art history. You might climb up a path that an artist's gone before and find their dead corpse with some adrenaline and some food and some water that you then take and you, you carry on a bit more. Actually, I really like Matthew and Ryan's work. It's sophisticated, intelligent, and I'd better whisper it, I also think it's really quite beautiful. In the end, perhaps it's that same slope all artists are attempting to scale, whether with paint, trainers, or white tracksuits. What's without doubt, though, is that there's still a wily old Frenchman somewhere presiding over their efforts. Are you aware that some people have blamed you for the death of art? I was delighted to be blamed in the first place because that was my intention to do something that would not please everybody. So did you unleash a monster, do you think? No, I don't think so. But you've been called the man who tried to kill off painting. No, no, I'm not enough of a figure for that, but I'm glad if I contributed to, to this cessation. <laughs> Did you ever think that history would judge you for what you've done? Oh, I don't care what the history is. That has, I don't even be, think I belong there. Oh, you Gallic charmer, you. At its worst, I think conceptual art's a bit like a bad joke. Once you've heard the punchline, it's dead. But at its best, it's genuinely thought-provoking. You might almost describe it as a form of applied philosophy. And that's exactly what Duchamp wanted it to be. If you're right, then the whole of contemporary art's no more than an elaborate game of strategy. But the conceptualist always one step ahead. By the way, check me. Ah! Judy Chicago is an American feminist artist and writer known for her large collaborative art installation pieces, which examine the role of women in history and culture.
Robert Smithson was an American artist famous for his use of photography in relation to sculpture and land art. His early exhibited artworks were collage works influenced by homoerotic drawings and clippings from beefcake magazines, science fiction, and early pop art. But, um, a work by Robert Smithson, and it dates to 1970, and it's called The Spiral Jetty. This is a photograph showing it. it must have been taken from a helicopter. And it's what you call a work of environmental art or land art. It's essentially a bunch of dirt and rubble that's been pushed out into the spiral form into a lake, into the Salt Lake in Utah. It just exists in this one place and at this one time. So it's, mm -hmm. could we say it's site specific? Right, exactly. We call it site specific. One of the things that Smithson wanted to emphasize was a kind of a distinction between, you know, the site of the work of art um, and the traditional site of the work of art, which would be a gallery or museum or a private home, and kind of breaking down barriers, saying, you know, is a work of art only to be contained by a museum or can we also find it elsewhere? And so he's part of a larger movement of artists who are specifically locating or situating their work in the land. Um, and oftentimes the works have these very, very large proportions, like this juts out 1,500 feet into the water. So and can it's you really, walk through it? You can usually walk on it. Um, well, not necessarily. It depends on the height of the uh, water itself. So sometimes it's submerged. So this photograph shows that there are some people out on the jetty. Yeah, I see. But it's been slightly covered by water, sometimes it's lower Salt. or higher, it depends on the depth of the water in mm -hmm. Utah at the time. And it's a very salty lake. So it's a work that really is certainly part of the environment, but also interacts and changes the environment in important ways. So you could also maybe categorize it under the category of process art because it's something that is forever changing. You know, he had one idea of it but then there are things that act upon it and will change it for, you know, as long as it's there. It's made of things that are so durable, though. One gets a sense of it existing you know, beyond human life. Mm. Right, and it has such a basic shape as well. Mm -hmm. He's interested in some ancient examples of prehistoric land art mounds that mm -hmm. have been found in America and elsewhere, and it's sort of inspired by that somewhat abstract quality of a lot of those. The idea that your vision of it right now is you see it as a totality. When you're in it, of course, you're only right. experiencing it in right. this very, very different way and seeing partial aspects of it. Yeah, what interests me is that you can go into it mm -hmm. and, and walk through it. Right, usually you're not supposed to touch it. the art. No, right. <laughs> I like that idea of touching it and being inside it. He liked it too, yeah. And um, of it's course, fun. it makes it fun. Yeah, and you had to, he had to use a lot of construction tools, massive trucks to drive the rubble down and um, also to employ a lot of people. So it really mm -hmm. destabilizes our idea that the artist There's is an creator. individual, right. a single person who is the mastermind. I mean, of course, he did come up with the scheme, mm -hmm. but he never could have realized this alone. Right, and that's such an important idea now. Things are can be made by groups of people, by mm -hmm. factories of people that the artist can employ. Right, and maybe he's going back also to what he thinks ancient art right. was like, that it was not done by a single genius artist, but that rather was, was communal. A, a communal thing. I was fervently working since early 68 on a project called Wrapped Cost. And desperately, we said to John, John, please try to find something. We will be very, very happy. This is how everything starts. Physical visualizing the work is so important. I cut out the uh, image of the rocks formation. I put the plastic and I start to draw shadow with the black wax crayon. But you see, I see too much of the landscape. By seeing too much the elements, I lose the, all the sculptural shades of the material we created because it's too, they're too pronounced, too visible. The fabric is the principal material to tra translate the nomadic quality of the work. And the wrap costs have a one and a half million square feet of fabric. We were enfolding the fabric, the ropes was enfolding, like a net of ropes was enfolding simultaneously to, to secure 
the, the, the materials. The water come, there are a lot of movement, we need to secure the rocks on these very slicky rocks. And one of these slicky rocks, I slept. An entire right shoulder come here. And I ran to the hospital, and the doctor in the hospital put it back the shoulder, and he was saying, I rubbed the shoulder of Christo. <laughs> and I was with like that. from the water line is absolutely unbelievable. That's probably the best view from the water line when you're down and you see this, this proportion. You only there can see the uh, unexpected change of forms the fabric take with the wind. It's not something like, you know, they will be like that. This is something we never, never expected. And of course, that's coming from the great wind. We never have this incredible wind of South Pacific. Unbelievable. Here is a fence that is 18 feet high and 24 and a half miles long. Uh, in equivalency, that's going from the museum in the center of DC to Dulles Airport. If somebody can get the idea of the monumentality, the thinking big, th these people are not thinking small, then they get the idea. I just knew um, that this was in my opinion, from what I had been a part of and all that was happening in the Bay Area at that time, the most important thing, and to have it come to California and to have him be working uh, on the, uh, the West Coast was, uh, I mean, something not to be missed. That's why I always think is how did Christo, coming from where he's coming from, have the insight to be able to see how he could construct uh, something that would go on like this ribbon of light that he talks about. Because really when you're up in the plane or even just, well you can see from the photographs, if you get back it just is this endless thing and it always just guides with the contour. And if I was like drawing, say, and I, I wanted to create something that was going around and, you know, uh, this is exactly what he's done with the fence. Uh, people don't forget it once they see it, you know. The first title was Divide, but not very friendly title. We decided that the fence would be better, but we, when we pulled a running fence, basically our fence was really running, not enclosing anything. It's running from east to west. And we tried to do a project involving the use of the land from the ocean, from the, near the ocean, going inland to the ranchers' land, going to suburbia, and finally arriving to the near small town. The fence is not the work of art. The work of art is all togetherness, meaning that the hills, the, the one, Panel fence is not the work of art, or two, or three, or two thousand panels is not work of art. They are designed to go through this very, uh, some way, ordinary landscape, but suddenly energized by underlying invisible topography of the land. Each project is the slice of our life, of me, Jean Claude, and basically, the particular moment we were much younger and we were capable to do that project. I probably I will never try to think to do that project again, but it's the incredible that we succeeded to do it. I wasn't working at the time, and so I went to the unemployment office, and they said that they needed workers for the Christos running fence. And at the time, I was 18, you know, free will, you know, something to do, so I decided to do it. Uh, it was tough because you had to carry the heavy material up and then hook up on the top and then hook up on the sides and the bottom. The hardest part was probably putting down the, the bottom.
because then you also have the wind and the pressure of the wind on both sides. To see how it's turned out now is just amazing to me. It's, you know, ex exhilarating to, to see all of these pictures and all the work that Christo had put into this. He put his heart into it, you can really tell. And Jean-Claude, of course. Christo's pink is turning into green for businesses offering unique ways to see the Surrounded Islands project. The pink art gallery in the Bay has intrigued some people to the point that they're willing to pay money to see it from the best angle. Barbara Goldstein, a tourist from New York, chose a bird's eye view. This afternoon, she spent $35 for a 10-minute airborne tour. I don't know whether it's art and I don't care, but I thought it was just great. Is it worth the $35? For sure. I'd do it again in a minute. Since Friday, this Miami helicopter company has taken more than 1,000 people on Christo rides, and that means big bucks. How much money do you think you've made so far? I don't know, probably about 30,000. And the Christo craze also means dollars for sightseeing boats like the Island Queen, which is offering Christo cruises. It's successful. It's been real good to us. Uh, it's a very slow time of the year, and uh, it's just been real great. And just how much money will the Surrounded Islands project mean for the artist himself? Well, Christo says, not one cent. I'm losing $3,150,000, but I have the project. That is most important. Christo raised the $3.1 million for the project through a $700,000 bank loan and by selling preliminary drawings like this one. The original reportedly sold for $10,000. Christo says he won't be making any money on all of this because he will not sell any photo rights to the Surrounded Islands project and he has no financial interest in Christo's souvenirs. I don't like to be involved with any commercial venture because I, keep, I like to keep my credibility very high and very pure. Robin Carter, Channel 4 News. It's amazing. But people don't understand if they would read better. For instance, many, many people uh, write... Look, look, look. Them, they, look them. they write, mm. we don't want them to wrap Central Park. We have no intention yes, whatsoever wrapping, yeah. of wrapping Central Park. <laughs> Has nothing that is to the do. little village of Jimba. Look there. Mm. Yeah, here you see the contrast. Yeah? Yes. Especially. Yeah, yeah. A contrast between the this uh, color thing. Oh, this hills. I don't know how much work we do to position <laughs> the place. To climb. Oh, look. look how many. Yes. Look. look. What? Total one thousand <laughs> seven hundred and sixty <laughs> yellow umbrellas. Yeah, exactly. And this is why I, uh, I, I cannot imagine what would be seven thousand five hundred gates. Yeah. The poles, yeah. Yeah. the poles is almost thick like the poles of the of the umbrellas. Yeah. 
of the gates. And of course, much closer because each, ga each gate is only 12 feet apart. Why am I so optimistic? I think there's going to be overwhelming enthusiasm. Yes, there gates. will be. But um, Al, the people who are against the project, it's always before they see it, yes. not after, yes. never yes. after, yes. only yes. before. Ay, ay, ay. This beautiful footage here. <gasps> also, you have to be there to to understand it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but but if you're not there, you, you are there when you see the film. Exactly. That's true. This is, you know, the film true. is incredible. And for 